Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our panel on genital bodies, trafficking, and labor in South Asia. Um, we're honored to be in conversation today with um, Dr. Chatterjee, Ms. Um, Uri Khaitan, and Ms. Amrita Das Gupta. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Um, my name is Vayoma Chirasma, and I'm a third year student at Tufts University studying history. Um, before I introduce the topic of discussion for today's event, a little bit about um, our organization. Um, the Tufts South Asian Regional Committee, or SARC, is a student-run academic discourse and research group striving to promote student engagement with social, political, historical, and economic affairs of the South Asian subcontinent. Um, SARC hopes to create a space for students of all backgrounds, ideologies, and identities to foster informed engagement with new and nuanced awareness of South Asia. Um, if you would like to um, sign up for our e-list, um, please do so uh, with the Google form that we will send out in the chat in a bit. Um, we would also like to thank the Tufts Institute of Global Leadership for making this event possible. Our discussion today will range from sex work and gendered labor during the Second World War and trafficking in the similar ones to organ trafficking in contemporary South Asia. Um, the panel promises to be a compre comprehensive discussion about the long duty history and practices of trafficking and gender labor extraction in South Asia. Um, our first speaker for today and the chair of this panel is uh, Dr. Sarad Mui Chatterjee, um, who is an affiliated lecturer at the Center of Development Studies at the University of Cambridge. Um, at the Center of Development Studies, Dr. Chatterjee leads a course on migration and human trafficking offered to MPhil students. She's also a bi fellow at um, the Lucy Cavendish College at the University of Cambridge and a research fellow at the Cambridge Center for Applied Research in Human Trafficking. Um, she, she researched the illegal trade in human organs focused on India. Um, our second speaker is um, Zodri Ketan, who is a PhD student in economic and social history at the University of Oxford. Um, her research interests are in gender and labor in colonial India. And her thesis focuses on women in the wartime economy in the Second South World War in South Asia. Our third speaker is um, Amrita Das Gupta, who is a doctoral student at the Department of Gender Studies at um, SOAS in the University of London. Um, she researches on transnational migration, borders, sex work, climate crisis in the lower uh, Deltaic Bengal. And her PhD deals with India and Bangladesh borderlands and trafficking in humans. Um, I will now hand um, our discussion over to um, Tadakata Dakta, who's a PhD student of history at Tufts. So over to you, Tadakata. Uh, thank you, Vayoma, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, as, my, as a moderator, I do not think I have uh, much to say when we already have Dr. Cherenji among us. Uh, for uh, starting us off with her introductory remark uh, on this panel. Uh, over to you, Dr. Chatterjee. Dr. Chatterjee, you need to unmute yourself first. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, Dr. Chet. Okay. I will st um, thank you so much, Dr. Hagada, for this uh, opportunity. So I'd like to start with a brief, uh, a very brief mention of a story from uh, Nobel laureate Ramana Tagus, a very famous story, uh, Bicharok. So uh, let me share my screen. So quote from this story of uh, Bicharok by Nomelo Romina Tego. So we have a character Kiroda who, whose uh, lover abandons her and runs away with all her possessions. And she was left with a little child. And so she could not bear the pain of seeing her wailing child for long. And then she lives to freedom from hunger, but to end her life and, and her child. 
but somehow she survives. But the judge sentences her to death for killing a child. So the story uh, very much shows that at that time that how much a patriarchal society did not have any sympathy for a woman like Kiroda because simply or in the in the judge's eye she was a, a sex worker, a kind of apparently a fallen woman. So the judge sentenced her to death sentence. And not only this story, there are several, uh, at, at that time, several fictions and non-fictions of the data showed this vulnerability of women, and with, uh, which led to uh, the state of severe deprivation, and in this case, uh, state of death. So now that was written a long time back, but how much it has changed now? How much? Even when we talk about the marginalized woman, the woman who, who who do not have voice, the woman beneath the service, as Ulbi will explain. And uh, how much wo freedom women have when, we, when they have to choose a work, choose especially a paid work uh, in terms of so in the stage of internal state of socioeconomic crisis. I will quote famous um, uh, philosopher about how she discusses uh, freedom of choice in work. She says, everyone, all of us take money for our services. We, some people receive good, good satisfactory wages. Some have good control over the working conditions, but a, a, a large number of people around the world do not have that control. Rather, she links that um, freedom of choice of work to privilege, economic privilege, that many, rather to choose a profession and desirable working condition is a, she said it's a luxury, which many people all over the world do not have. And many genuinely problematic range of activi uh, activities or work engaged by women. And when we deeply inquire into their lives, we'll see they have very little choice in very little freedom in choosing those employment because they're severely constrained by very poor, very little options. Rather sometimes no choices at all. It's just a matter of survival for them in certain circumstances. So as we go, go forward today, we'll discuss some of these circumstances, these socioeconomic deprivations in which women, uh, uh, some socioeconomic deprivations women encounter and what kind of choices they make in those situations. And um, Urbi, uh, Urbi will give us an historical account of that. And Omrita will discuss in a, uh, how women in, in, in the situation of climate change induced migration and climate change induced risk, how women cope with those situations. And I will go on to discuss uh, uh, how, what women, how women save their families or bring income to their family in terms of another kind of crisis when they have to sell their body parts. So I welcome Urvi to present. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. What, um, what do you be? Uh, perhaps you want to share your slides? Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Um, Chatterjee, uh, you have to uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. stop uh, screen sharing. Right, thank you. I'm just going to attempt to share my slides now. I hope that's visible. All right. Great. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, and thank you, uh, Sark, for organizing this. So following on from Dr. Chatterjee's remarks, uh, the question of women's work and survival and its importance has really hit home over the last year. Socioeconomic upheaval tremendously impacts people who live the most vulnerable and precarious lives. And as a historian, I've been preoccupied with these questions in my own research, which focuses on women in the wartime economy of Second World War South Asia. So my talk today focuses on the gendered and racialized bodies of women in the midst of unprecedented crises in 1940s India. So the 1940s are arguably modern, India, modern India's most dramatic and pivotal decade, apart from maybe the one we're in right now. But only recently have historians begun moving beyond independence movements and elite level politics. The events of 1947 followed closely on the heels of uh, massive upheaval generated by war and famine. And the Raj, as research by Ashley Jackson and Yasmin Khan has shown, was central to the Allied war effort. Um, a rising flood of resources was traveling from the Indian subcontinent all over the world in support of this war effort. 
And the Second World War brought with it massive inflation and crisis after crisis began to hit Eastern India in particular. Cyclone, tidal wave, famine and epidemics were accompanied by a growing Japanese threat on India's Eastern borders. So my question is how did these huge socioeconomic changes in such a short period of time affect ordinary people and particularly women who led the most vulner vulnerable and precarious lives. So particularly lower caste and Adivasi women. So in April, 1945, the Indian Communist Party sent um, Ali Sardar Jafri uh, to Cox's Bazaar, in, which is now in modern day Bangladesh. Cox's Bazaar was at the time a hub for allied soldiers who were participating in the Burma campaigns of the Second World War. So there were soldiers from Britain, the United States and West Africa who uh, were occupying the city. And today this is the site of, uh, this is a site of the ongoing Rohingya refugee crisis. So now the communist party activist met uh, several young women there. And he quotes one woman in particular, a young teenage girl, open quote, he sold me to a military man for 500. My body costs 500 rupees. When he dies, God will take those 500 rupees from his flesh. Tell me, is God just? Won't he torture my brother in his grave for selling his sister? End quote. This unnamed girl was one of potentially thousands of women who had been sold by their families in the wake of the Bengal famine of 1943. Cox's Bazaar was crowded with several women and men who were still struggling with the after effects of this famine. When rural cultivators ran out of property to sell to afford skyrocketing prices of rice, women had been next on the market. Many of them ended up in cities like Cox's Bazaar where clients were plentiful and or wound up in military work in manual labor and factories. So the unnamed teenage girl who had been sold by her brother was a member of the labor corps which was a contingent of at least 30,000 women in Bengal that worked for the British Indian War Machine. And so my presentation today explores the Labor Corps in Eastern Bengal as a case study of women's experiences of the labor market in war and famine. So the Bengal famine had a death toll of between three and five million and economists, historians and scientists alike have persuasively shown that the famine resulted from wartime policy failure rather than actual food shortage. Along with um, the devastating famine, malaria, smallpox, and cholera decimated the population of Bengal. But curiously, while the image of starving mother and child was ubiquitous in contemporary accounts of the famine, we don't yet have a women's history of the famine. Generally, women have been conceived of as passive victims who were driven to prostitution out of crippling hunger. Now that is not inaccurate, but it is a simplification. And I argue that it is a unidimensional approach uh, that is problematic for at least three reasons. So first, it ignores a longer term history of complex and multi sectoral women's labor market activity in Bengal in diverse occupations, whether it's in agriculture, paddy husking, transport trade and others. Secondly, by constantly seeing women in relationship to male earners, it ignores the fact that women as individuals also lost their own livelihoods. And finally, uh, while saying that women took to sex work because of starvation is not incorrect, it is a simplification that does not address the absence of choice in such a labor market. And the mechanisms by which that choice was taken away from women have not been analyzed yet. So first let's look at some data to give you some idea of this massive upheaval that's happened. So I draw here on a survey conducted by Mahala Nobis Mukherjee and Ghosh, which was also used by Amartya Sen in his work on the famine and present here data disaggregated by age and sex. So at the time in Bengal, there were 108 men for every 100 women. So there was a higher, there was an uneven sex ratio. Male mortality was higher in the famine. So more men than women died. But here I'm interested specifically in the question of survival. So I look at the survivors of the famine. And if we look at the, um, the effects through destitution, which is through impoverishment, it is the data clearly show that women were disproportionately disproportionately displaced in comparison to men. So in these charts here, the blue is for male and the red for female. If we look at the estimated destitutes in January 1943 and May 1944, the two charts at the top, um, there, are more men, there are more women than men. The only age category in which uh, there are more male destitutes than female destitutes is in the age category of between five and 15. In all of the other age categories, there are more women. 
In the 15 to 50 age category, which is the working adult age category, the number of women destituted is double the number of men. Uh, so in January 1943, there were a total of 750,000 destitute people. Uh, in May 1944, that number had gone up to cross over a million. And uh, so the chart at the bottom, which shows the difference in between the two charts, so the new newly destituted people in that famine period, um, in the adult age category, 45,000 adult males were destituted compared to 97,000 adult women. So more than double the number. Now this chart here, um, it summarizes adult destitution in May 1944 based on the occupation that they would have held in 1943. Again here, the red is for female and the blue is for male. Women outnumber men in uh, all categories in terms of destitution, particularly those women who were in agricultural uh, labor occupations. The only category in which there are more men than women who are destituted is in non-agricultural labor. So uh, some people were able to escape destitution, but they suffered a degradation in their economic status. So they either lost access to a livelihood or they had to sell their assets and therefore th their income earning capacity reduced. There are about 3.8 million people who suffered such a kind of degradation. Um, and of course, low caste uh, or scheduled caste rural women were massively overrepresented in these figures. So for example, in 1941, 50 year old Narmada Dasi had been well to do with four acres of land, a husband and five children. The next year, the cyclone and tidal wave in Kontai and Tamluk took away her husband and four of her children. And by July, 1943, she was living on the Baliganj railway station platform in Calcutta. But meanwhile, a joint British and American campaign to recover Burma and conduct raids on, Jap on Japan necessitated the expansion of military bases in Eastern India, particularly Bengal. Uh, various ports in the province were also important points in transnational supply lines. And a veritable army of laborers was needed for this war effort. And so Frida Bedi writes in January, about January 1944, open quote, the drifting tide of the helpless on Bengal's frontier is not going to the relief kitchens this year. It is finding its way into the ranks of the labor corps run by contractors, which does the 101 odd jobs necessary in the hinterland of the army, building and maintaining roads and clearing the jungle. So women worked in a variety of roles. Here you can see them um, carrying tankers of oil, which have arrived from Texas at, in Calcutta. Uh, this is women laying the groundwork for airfield runways. These are photographs, by the way, which are drawn from the US Army Air Force records. Uh, crushing stones to help, um, again, in airfield construction. And photographs like this one were quite uh, prominently shared. Uh, it is definitely an effort to juxtapose um, the East against the modern West. So here we have this photo, which is captioned native Indian women carrying baskets on their heads, representing the one of the oldest forms of transportation, juxtaposed against the most modern aircraft of the time, the B-29 Super Fortress. And as you will notice, they are barefoot without any protective equipment, no shoes, um, saris without blouses, and the saris hitched up. Um, to their knees as they worked. Uh, so for the uh, rest of the presentation, I'm going to take a deep dive into Chittagong, uh, where, the, where this labor corps had taken on an even more coercive form. And this was concentrated in the eastern end of the Bengal province, uh, which is in modern day Bangladesh. So I'm going to return to Cox's Bazaar as I started this presentation with. So these women in uh, the labor corps in Cox's Bazaar worked in aerodromes, in jetty building, in road construction, loading and unloading and all other kinds of manual labor that were considered unskilled by day. But they worked as sex workers by night. Um, a, as a communist party activist reported in his report on his visit to Cox's Bazaar, the contractors wanted women for the military and the women wanted cash for food. He also interviewed a 10 year old boy, Suleiman, who said, two truckloads of women go to work from our village. In the night, sahibs come to the contractor's house. I saw all sorts of women going there, end quote. So there were three main routes by which women ended up in the core. The first was those who were in extreme economic distress and had lost their livelihoods or had been abandoned by their families. But the second route appears to have been the most, prime, uh, the most prominent one, which was through trafficking. So the selling of girls appears to have become a relatively common phenomenon at the time because there were multiple reports about agents 
supplying the military with girls aged 12 and older. The girls were then taken by boat to centers near the coast to be sold. Prices ranged from between 10 annas and 1 rupee 8 annas, that would be at the time 11 to 27 pence. In Borishal, for example, a Hindu woman sold her daughter to a Muslim for the unusually high price of 12 rupees. Um, newspapers reported about boatloads of human cargo that were sold and intercepted. And once sold, women were then drafted to various brothels. Uh, the Women's Self-Defense League or the Mahila Atma Raksha Samiti, which was a communist party relief organization, uh, has been quoted saying, this practice is fully recognized and no effort at prevention is made by any person in authority, end quote. And the third uh, group of laborers included recruits from the local population. And in Cox's Bazaar, this included an Arakanese ethnic group of monks. So the labor corps was not a homogenous body of labor, but it cleaved together ethnic and religious groups through the unifying experience of displacement and destitution. And of course, naturally, there were informal methods of recruitment, payment, management, and absence of regulation, since much of the management was done through military contractors, which meant that exploitation and discretionary policies were used um, prolifically. So on top of this already exploitative and punishing nature of work, there was also the ever-present risk of sexual assault. So Suleiman again was quoted saying, if the women did not go to the soldiers, the soldiers came to the women and forced them. Um, and of course, this was going to have a devastating impact on mental health, for instance. So let's return for a second to the girl that I began this presentation with, the one who was sold for 500 rupees by her brother. When the Communist Party activists had found her, she had been uh, sitting by the roadside crying bitterly and hurling abuses. And in the midst of her fragmented responses, uh, one wonders whether she was really sold for 500 rupees when other women were being sold for even less than a rupee. But it is the military truck that emerges as a major site of her trauma in her responses to her interviewers. She says, you can never be sure what will happen in a truck. And at one point in, the, in her conversation with her interviewers, a truck full of white soldiers arrived and the interviewers describe her trembling and retreating within herself like a terrified bird when she saw them. But there was a complex range of experiences of life in the core. And so there were some women who were able to reclaim um, their lives in some sense. And so it is the, the story of 22-year-old Chehru that really, come, that really strikes me as very interesting. So uh, she had lost a family who were agricultural laborers during the famine and epidemics and had to take to the streets where she eventually joined the labor corps. But her youth and charm won the favors of the sahibs very soon and she became a maji or the head of a group of laborers. And after some time, a small contractor. Now she did not work. Her job was to supply women to the labor corps. Thus she sold her own body and made other women sell their chastity. She became a pimp. She became powerful with the support of the sahibs and started wearing high heeled shoes and a wristwatch. She would move about with a stick in her hand. She insulted anyone she liked, says Jaffrey in his report. By July 1945, the labor corps had been shut down, but without providing for alternative employment opportunities for the women who were once again without livelihoods. What happened to the once again displaced women is unclear. There was no coordinated or centralized relief strategies, and many of them found themselves homeless once again. So just to uh, conclude my presentation, none of the distressing outcomes described above were inevitable. The labor corps signals an intentionally unregulated wartime labor regime that was characterized by growing co coercion and was aided by the colonial state's willingness to turn a blind eye. Some of my other research looks at women who worked in coal mines, uh, battling famine and inflation, where they were coerced and disciplined through the threat of starvation. But I argue that women in their own right lost their own livelihoods and their own sources of income. Many of them were sold by their families or trafficked into sex work. Even then, they were not simply passive victims, but they actively looked for strategies to survive and make do while facing exploitative conditions. Whether it was through relief kitchens, charity, working in coal mines, manual labor, sex work, or several of these combined, all while they bore a disproportionate burden of an ex increasingly extractive and command-based economy. With a colonial state that had basically failed them, they were women at the front line in the battle for survival. Thank you. Thank you, Urbi, for that uh, wonderful presentation <clears throat> and uh, giving us a, starting us off with that, uh, historic perspective. Um, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Amrita Das Gupta for 
her more contemporary presentation. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank um, Top South Asian Regional Committee for inviting me for the panel. Uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Chatterjee and Mubi for being a part of it. And I would like to thank Dr. Wato for bringing us all together. So I just share my screen first. start with the quote where we started because I find it uh, very uh, related to the to the presentation that I'm going to give at the moment. She said, she quoted rather, my body costs 500 rupees, would God torture my brother in his grave for selling his sister? This is the basic theme that shall, shall run through my talk by addressing the social, uh, socioeconomic and religious deprivations caused by climate crisis in the age of Anthropocene, which, as Dr. Chatterjee quoted from Novosam, left women with no choice in the Sundarbans. The Sundarbans, world's only mangrove tiger land straddling between India and Bangladesh, was in news very recently owing to its devastation by the super cyclone Alpha. The even sparked an unresolved debate hinged on the fact that the removal of humans from Sundarbans should save the mangroves, Kolkata's first line of environmental defense. Regarding which, two points had been highlighted. First, government-led evacuations can lead to violence and murderous situations like the Mori Chapi massacre, where the government forcibly evicted hundreds of Bengali Hindu Dalit refugees from the Mori Chapi Island, citing the illegal occupation of the protected reserve forest land in 1979. Second, planned retreat might reduce the effect of the escalating water levels on the islands, but might not allow the islanders to live behind the burdens of socioeconomic marginalization, and the migrants shall subsequently face a continued denial of basic services. Nonetheless, the climatic vulnerability of living in Sundarbans is shown to be is, is historical, is historically evident as is reflected by Reynolds' map of the 1771, where all the Sundarbans is shown to be depopulated by the mass. Though Renel attributes the reason of depopulation to the repeated exploitation by the mass in the Sundarbans, Historians and sociologists employing the N.A. Akbari, Riyasul Salati, the Bengal District Gazetteer on the uh, 24 Parganas by L.S.S. O'Malley as evidence, postulates that the ravages caused by the tropical cyclone in the area in 1582, 1584, 1688, 1699, 1739 has had been at the heart of this migratory phenomenon, uh, resulting in depopulation of Sundarbans. The climatic catastrophes continue to multiply in the Atro Bhatti beach and bear the potential to render the islanders as climate exiles. Climate exiles are those who are forced to move from their homes owing to severe environmental conditions. The women of Sundarbans face two faceted evils, one climatic and another societal or religious. Both are intrinsically related. The escalation of sea levels renders the land water divide soluble thereby forcing the humans and non-humans of the area into a di direct conflict. Today's presentation aims uh, to use ethnographic data, photographs, uh, interviews, and archival mat materials in the form of news reports to study the impact of climate and religion uh, in compelling the female islanders to migrate in search of better living conditions or be trafficked into sex work. In so doing, the paper shall attempt to build an answer towards how these women identify themselves. Are they trafficked women, uh, animal attack widows, sex workers, or climate exiles? It is also imperative to evaluate if certain identities overlap. If yes, how? The Sundarbans witness an overlap between the animal inhabited forests and the cleared lands of human habitation. It is a common practice in the land of the ebb and flow to enter uh, the forest on a quotidian basis in search of food, wax, honey, fruits, the stocks of which are sold in the market to earn a living. The repeated intrusion of the humans into the forest increases the probability of animal attacks. Through the though the tiger is the most famous here, 
the other animals that are equally feared are the snakes and the crocodiles. So much so that the death rituals of those who have lost their lives through the tiger attack was different from those that who lost their lives to the crocodile attacks or snake bite. Tiger attack dead bodies are either never recovered from the site or buried, denied a Hindu fire. Snake bite dead bodies are set afloat on a bamboo raft. However, such practices are obscure now to the extent that they seem mythological. The level of ostracization is also different for widows who lose their husbands to the tiger attack compared to those who lose their husbands to other animal attacks. This exhibits the cultural hegemony of the bone baby cult in the lower Del Tai finger. Bone baby Juburanama, the miracles of bone baby, narrates the birth uh, and life of bone baby, uh, which is also translatable into English as the mistress of the forest, and her brother, Shah Jongwadi. Abandoned at birth amidst the forest, raised by a deer as her own, Bone Baby was only united with her uh, family and twin brother at an adult age when conscience dawned upon her parents for having forsaken her owing to some preference. Soon after the reunion, Bone Baby and Shah Jongoli was instructed by Allah to visit the land of the ebb and flow to settle the conflict between the shape-shifting sage Dokhin Rai, the commander of the tigers and the islanders. Dokin Rai uh, was known to attack and kill anyone who claimed resources from his forest. To resolve the inequality, Bone Baby, alongside her brother, waged long wars against Narayan, Dokin Rai's mother, who had ultimately surrendered herself, drawing a truce by calling Bone Baby her soul, uh, meaning soul system. However, the greed of Thona and Mona, two local businessmen from a nearby village, resulted in the ultimate end of the rule of the Dokin Rai. Dhanha and Mona, in return of the resources garnered from Rai's forest, left back their nephew Dukhe as a, a means of sacrifice. Dukhe sought refuge under the wings of Mabono. Another war ensued and concluded in the final defeat of Rai. This propelled Bonobibi to divide land between the humans and the non humans. She also decreed that she would never save any of those from tiger attacks who shall accumulate forest resources out of greed. Thus began the superstitions around tiger attacks, being elements, irrespective of the religious inclinations of those attacked, attacked only to be avoided by the penitence uh, of an observance of austerity by the wives back home. Mabono Bibi's presence and dictates supersedes the other cult gods and goddesses of the re re region, like uh, Kalurai, Makal Thakur, and Mamanusha. She is the goddess of both the Muslims and Hindus of the Sundarbans. Her Jolbunarama, though recited uh, following the Hindu rhythmic chants, uh, that is the Do for the Puar, the book reads according to the Arabic script, that is from left to right. The idea primarily stems from the belief that Ma Bonobibi, though the overseer of all, irrespective of the animal species and the human occupation, she has a special say and doing in relation to the tigers only, and not the snake or the crocodiles. Hence the burden of the Swami Kejo, which means a uh, uh, husband eater, uh, a slur is uh, shouldered by the tiger widows only. However, the myth has found historical prominence in line with uh, the creation of the cultivable lands and building of the agricultural frontier in the lower Delta Bengal. During my year-long field work at the Bali Island and Dunhi village of the Sundarbans in the year 2016 and 17, the hand-in-glove relation of the climate crisis, tiger attack, ostracization, and trafficking became evident. I had interviewed more than 50 tiger widows in both the villages, and most of them had used the Isla cyclonic storm, which, has ha which had happened in the 2009 as the point of re reference as if they had lost their sense of time or have had built their sense of time and chronology from that climatic catastrophe. Paputi Mondol, obviously I have changed her name, of Dulki, who lost her husband, Poritosh Mondol, on March 29, 2017, near Pirbonj, centered her entire narrative around the overlapping land, water, uh, land forest divide escalated by the 2009 cyclone which made it easier for the tigers to swim across the Vidadhuri River and come into the villages from the forest. Her main point being that the climatic onslaught has made the human inhabited lands more accessible to the tigers from the forest. Another uh, tiger widow, whom I would like to call Shubhashi Das, she lost her husband to the tiger attack some 20 years ago, but her neighbors tell it was just after Isla that Shubhashi's husband never returned home from the Delta. 
The two other aspects which joined the line of my argument was when I asked a group of tiger widows uh, and a tiger widow to pose for me standing on the boat. The tiger widows had protested. They told me they cannot access the boat. Only the tiger widow can, as he was a man. The reason they gave me was entirely rooted in the religious dictates of the Delta. They told, we are tiger widows, not any other widow. Or we are ill omens. We have lost our right to access the boat of occupation. Our sons feed us if we have any. If not, we live by begging. We will stand on the ground, let him stand on the boat, take our picture like this. This meant that if any of these women were skilled in fishing, they were now inevitably kept away from it by denying them access to the boat and thus denying them a rightful access to livelihood, thereby making these women more vulnerable to fall promises of housemaid jobs in the city and to being coerced into the nexus of trafficking in humans. The early rise, uh, yearly rise of the women uh, trafficked from the Sundarbans to Shonagachi, Asia's most famous brothel in Kolkata, West Bengal, after any cyclonic storm or due to lack of occupation for these women uh, in the lower Delta in Bengal proves this. A news report by HuffPost titled uh, Between the Dead Sea and Living Hell dated uh, July 1st, 2016 quotes, around 7,000 people work in the district and 600 to 700 workers joined in the industry, that is the red light industry annually. According to Dr. Shomoji Chana, an epidemiologist who works with the Bar Mahila Shomana Committee, a collective that fights for the right of the sex workers during the year, uh, says that during the year I la hit, that is 2009, there was a 20 to 25 increase, 20 to 25 percent increase in the number of sex workers moving to the red light district from Shuman. Many of these women interviewees refer to themselves as Bhasha Manish, which translates into fat flooded women. But what intrigued me more was how did these women identify themselves? The connect of these women with water and land erosional dynamics is again underlined by using the phrase Pasha Manish. It is not only used in relation to climate crisis, the escalation of the water levels in Sundarbans, but also in relation to the conventional usage of the Bengali term Pashai Dilo, which means flooded me, uh, which essentially translates into abandonment a similar emotion noted by the inhabitants of the grotto, abandoned by their nation, family, and even the almighty. So I end my presentation here. Thank you, Amrita, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I would now uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Chatterjee for her presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Gato, and thank you so much, Omrita and Uri, those, for those wonderful and very powerful presentations. Um, I will not take much time and directly go to uh, go to my very brief presentation so that we have some time for discussion. So I'll share my slide. Uh, Is my is my slide visible? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. You can click share screen and then choose the screen, but the presentation has to be open first. That's true. What happened suddenly? Hmm. Uh, Dr. Charity, I think you need to open the presentation in the background. It's already and, open. It's already open. And then, and then uh, share screen. It's already open. That's the thing. Because that time I did share, so it was already open. Now I can't find it. That's the, I don't know. Okay. Uh, don't worry. Take your time. It's fine. Happened. Maybe I will open. It's already opened my slide. So, and that time I did not uh, closed it when I shared last time. 
So uh, perhaps uh, uh, you can see, uh, perhaps you can see at the uh, bottom of your screen if there's a uh, symbol with P that's PowerPoint um, towards your left, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think now, now uh, you can see. Uh, can you no, see my slide? Uh, uh, no, we can't see your slide. We can see your screen, but we can't see your slides. Uh, you, uh, it, what's open is your basically your uh, web browser. I don't know how to solve this now. If I, if I, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Chatterjee, you might want to mail mail them to me. Yeah, uh, and I can I can share it for you. Okay. Oh, found it. Yes. Right moment. Is uh, it visible okay. now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Sorry, so my, my own work, uh, research I focused on illegal organ trade in India. So uh, very briefly, why, why there is a market in organ trade? Because there is a demand and supply gap in organs. And especially the, the the trade is mainly in kidneys because we have a spare part, which we can, um, and as we know, we can all survive on one kidney and donate the other kidney. And because it's worldwide, uh, there is a large uh, in increasing cases of end stage kidney disease, enterorenal disease, and there is a uh, great demand of, of kidney transplantation, which the supply side uh, was not able to keep up with. And so to meet the gap between demand and supply, so there is a black market in organs, which, which uh, emerged in after we have successful, after we are able to establish good uh, transplant uh, services in our country and everywhere in the world. So, but there is a, uh, so very briefly, you can see my slide that there is, uh, I'm focusing on India. There are concurrently there, there cases of uh, trade in organs. Mm. Um, there was in, in 1980s, there was a legal market in organs initially that women would, uh, women and men will sell kidneys and for nominal cost and patients all over the world will come to India for a transplant. But then Indian government, uh, but then there were, uh, there were a lot of exploitation of the organ sellers that sometimes they will not be paid. Sometimes the, in, in absence of the knowledge, organs will be taken. So Indian government banned the sale of organs. But uh, then banning the sale of organs did not stop the cases of kidney disease to rise. So somewhere this gap needs to be fulfilled so that then, then the, the black markets, black market in organ trade arose. And as you can see, there are in 2003, four constantly, there are uh, the media reported cases of illegal trade in organs. And, but what I want to focus today that there is a gender dimension. There's a gender damage in this trade in organs. So Schaefer Hughes, who has conducted this study in 12 countries, she, she found that, uh, that women are really the receiver of organs. They are mainly donors. Women donate and men receive. So especially in poorer countries like India, families of impoverished women would encourage or sometimes coerce women to sell their kidneys and uh, to avert any risk to the husbands. So it's, it's mainly women. So when I, I'll go to my two case studies very brief. So I interviewed these two kidney sellers in the Southern part of India. And so she was a woman, um, why she sold her kidney? Because her husband took a lot of, uh, borrowed a lot of money from the local money lender to buy a, a tuk-tuk or auto rickshaw but somehow that business uh, did not uh, was not successful. So she, the husband, incurred a lot of debt, and the money lender was after the life of the husband. And also, the around that time, the the woman told me that her daughter's marriage was impending, so the family needed a lot of money. So what what she did, she was the savior kind of. She sold her she sold her kidney to get the amount of money, and with that money. And they paid back the money lender and also did a daughter marriage. So for the time being, their family was safe from the financial crisis. 
similarly another woman she sold her she saved her family from being homeless so they could not pay the rent and so their family was in the on the verge of being evicted from the home so she sold her kidney but what you can see from the narratives of these two women they both say that i regret uh, selling my kidneys but that time they did not have any choice choice again a choiceless situation as i will quote urvi and amrita reduced to a choiceless situation and both these women had to step up to sacrifice their organ and save their family from dire financial crisis but so when i interviewed this woman it was uh there was some uh, it was some yes to, so 2007 the first woman my of course the names changed the maya um say sold her organ and seema um even before when the organ when the organ market was legal in india in 1980s so but both of them explained that their family is still in huge financial crisis so they were uh, they were saying that i regret and i st even stop others to sell kidneys because they don't do any good to our financial situation we are still at the same stage of financial crisis but minus an organ minus an organ and we can't even go back to a same state of physical activity so the criticism is the conclusion is that these organ sellers they will sell kidney to save their family from a huge financial crisis but in long term they that do not do any benefit to their financial situation of the family rather their capacity to earn decreases so socio economically and also there is a stigma attached to it that you have sold kidney so um, and it is not look a very good light from the society but still in a dire situation financial crisis they resorted to selling their kidney but you you but one thing to observe that you will that amaya uh, the the woman who her husband incurs the debt from the money lender but she sells the kidney not the husband so that is so what i want to focus is there's a gender dimension to this kidney trade so whether uh, so whether it is a pay, uh, whether it is a paid uh, paid a uh, kidney cell or someone from a family would like would like to save a dear one's life to save the family member there is there is a gender dimension so women all over the world will tend to donate organs or sell organs more in proportion than men so as i as i would argue that all choices are made in a specific socio cultural context so why women are selling kidneys or donating more kidneys organs all over the world and more specifically in a gender divisive society like india because uh, in a patriarchal society like india men are considered the main breadwinners so their health are supposed to be preserved so you sh they should not sell their kidney and affect their health their health should be preserved and the studies say because women have the kind of obligation to save their family members from suffering so they are tend to do the sacrifice more but there are also coercion here uh, plays a big role in some families so because the women in in the where the women have a uh, low bargaining power they are more marginalized in their power hierarchy in a family they are in a coercive situation if they don't sell a kidney they they may not be able to survive in a family they may not be survive in a marriage so there is also coercion which uh, so it is several cases a coerced choice and it is similarly in bangladesh we have observed that that women they're not able to pay pay back to the for to the micro credit they have taken loans they are selling kidneys to pay back the loans so there are also uh, in a case the woman um, incurs huge debt and not able to pay, pay back uh, the loan and the husband was on the threat of giving a divorce so to to purchase her dignity and security in the marital household she sells a kidney so it's again in several cases a matter of survival and a coerced choice thank you i will not elaborate more and i will open the floor for discussion um thank you uh, dr chatterji for that wonderful presentation uh i would uh, invite uh, everyone to put their questions in the q and a uh but i would like to just uh, start us off with perhaps uh, a question each uh to our three wonderful speakers uh uh urvi's presentation uh, was particularly fascinating for me uh, because the student of history a lot uh, resonated with my own work 
uh, my question to you is that you know this reminded me quite a bit about the comfort woman uh, uh, that we all hear about in the context uh, of the far east in the second world war and the japanese use of comfort woman uh, but you know uh, my question is a more theoretical question that is there something uh, about military and war which kind of requires this kind of uh, supply of women and you know uh, we have heard of this kind of uh, narratives uh, this is something that we haven't heard about the labor corps as much uh, in south asia but we have definitely heard of the uh, comfort women and also in nazi germany uh, such practices uh, but what about in the in the post colonial colonial scenario and is can there be a more theoretical argument uh, be made about a military war and the need for uh, you know women uh, a prostitution of women in in such scenarios uh, sure. yeah. uh, uh thank you uh, tathagat for that question and just before i answered i wanted to thank dr chatterji and amrita for their really powerful and thought provoking thought provoking presentations thanks very much for those um and just okay so to answer your question or oh, well not answer attempt to answer because huge question um i think in the case of what we see specifically in south asia in in the wake of the famine i think um it tells us a lot about the indispensability of people and which groups in the empire for instance were seen as more indispensable than others so um i think what there is is there is a consistent effort at really pushing the boundaries of what kind of behaviors are tolerated and accepted because what is happening at the labor corps was at the time fairly well known you know these articles were published in newspapers these newspapers were circulated internationally uh but a few things come into play there one is uh, of course this is a communist party organ which is publicizing this secondly at the time the story about the labor co leaves india it's 1945 okay it's april 2 by the time the articles are published it's nearly june or july so the war is really about to end and the western world is too jubilant after a point to really notice the havoc it has wreaked in the periphery of the empire here so i think that is one of the reasons why that kind of gets lost why that story um ended up then being overshadowed by also huge displacements that happened within south asia just a couple of years after that with 1947 and what happens there so i think yes in that sense that there is a larger argument about uh that military and the need well the supply of women in in that kind of if i just have to put it very bluntly but i think the colonial context makes it even more interesting because i think there is more license given to certain parts of the empire to really exploit people who are present and i think that makes it a slightly more uncomfortable story um so yes that was and the second i think you also asked about the post colonial scenario and that is something uh, just to very quickly because i know we don't have a lot of time is uh, that obviously this is these have huge intergenerational consequences and it is very hard to pick up on how and what because um these are women who are invisible in the historical record so these are stories that we might need to we might not have interviews or things like that in terms of picking up but maybe there are larger labor force participation trends which continue to fall in bengal which we can think about in the context of these changes that are happening in the 1940s so thanks yeah thank you uh, urvi uh my second question would be to amrita uh, uh it was very interesting to uh, see that picture where the tiger wid widower is allowed to stand on the boat whereas the uh, women or the widows are not uh, i was wondering uh, is there uh, any, any particular ritual or are there any particular rituals uh, which kind of enforces this kind of uh, patriarchy that the tiger widows are uh, kind of expected to follow uh, in in the sundar thank you for this question so uh, basically more than the tiger widows uh, when these women are actually married and their husbands are alive uh, these rituals basically 
they they're expected to perform these rituals, these rituals of austerity, so that they would not uh, wear bangles, they would not put vermilion on their on their forehead, they would not wear good clothes, they would not eat good good food while their husbands are out on the delta or, or in the forest. So these rituals are not basically because as soon as you become a tiger widow, just like any other widow, you do not. It's it seem like you have no other value in the family because maybe you will now not be able to reproduce sons. Uh, so, so your value is gone. Uh, and more than that, uh, in Sundarbans, women have, uh, the, the society attaches to these married women uh, a kind of uh, responsibility, the responsibility to save their husbands, like, like uh, Sharada Moi, Dr. Chatterjee was saying, uh, the, you know, the responsibility is on the women to save their, their men from the debts that, that they have incurred. Uh, so this, this responsibility is on the women to save their husbands from tiger attack by following rituals, by praying to praying to uh, Mabon Vivian. And, and the most prominent ritual I can actually remember is uh, practicing austerity even before uh, they have uh, become widows themselves. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Amelia, for that uh, wonderful answer. Uh, uh, and my final question would be to Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, uh, interesting that you mentioned that uh, women are supposed to be uh, the ones giving up their organs uh, because they're not the primary breadwinners. Uh, but in a largely agrarian country uh, like India, <clears throat> women are breadwinners uh, in some ways. Uh, they perform uh, huge agrarian uh, labor. Uh, also, you know, most of the domestic sector or domestic health sector is, uh, you know, employed, uh, uh, you know, employs women. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, uh, with this kind of attitude where women are disproportionately affected when it comes to uh, organ trade or, you know, being forced to give up their organs, you know, how does that affect the uh, sort of breadwinning activity of the entire household? Actually, the... And I think we lost. Sorry, yeah. We can hear you. You're right. yeah. Yes, you were right. But problem is about recognition. So another another author Cohen, uh, he he studied uh, thirty women who sold their kidneys. Then it's when they were asked why you sold their kidneys in uh, not your husband, they gave the same same answer that oh no, they have to work. But ironically, these same women have gone back to work within two, three days of after, uh, donate, after giving up their kidneys. That is the problem. It's not about actually they're not the breadwinner. It's about that recognition, about uh, recognition from the society, recognition from themselves, that they are also equally part, equal participant in, the, in, in paid work, in earning money. Because of this uh, prevalent... Uh, notion that men have to be the breadwinner in the family and they should be recognized that way. So that, and also this, perhaps it's also this sense of, um, uh, as I said, they have, they take the responsibility to relieve suffering. That's social norms. As I said, the choice is made in a specific socio-cultural context is the social norms, which would drive this choice that, no, I have to save my family. But Problem becomes when there is no other option, as 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 the as we say about choice, as we say about incapability approach. That will they have other alternatives? Are they given enough options not to sell? Will the husband come forward? Then then that is a different cause. The husbands are not willing to come forward. The men members of the family are not willing to come forward. So what happens all over the world? In India, the divide is even wider. That it's always the Mothers, sisters, wives, they are giving up their organs, not the fathers, brothers, or, or husbands. So one of the uh, pro medical professional I was interviewed, she, she said that when a husband is donating to his wife, she, he's doing a great job, something heroic. But for the wife in our Indian, so it's an obligation, she has to, it's just taken for granted. So it's not, Actually, in terms that they, they are not uh, contributing uh, economically to the family, it's that prevalent notion, the social norms. 
social cultural social which would drive this choice so that is the biggest problem here so yes when a mother is donating her kidney to the children yes she she definitely has to save uh, save the life and that mother with a motherly love and affection uh, but when in certain circumstances the wife has to perhaps she has to save her place in the family and especially those marginalized women who has who, who do not have much exit options like if not if i don't sell my kidney uh, driven to the situation i may be i may be thrown out from the marital household so in when it becomes a state of survival it's a matter of survival it's a crisis situation so and no other alternative so few things social norms exit options alternatives they all these things all together drive this choice if i'm able to explain this now thank you thank you dr chatji uh, i think uh, we have a few questions uh, from our uh, audience uh, the first question is by asmaul husna uh, i think the question is to amrita Uh, referring to your presentation in the contemporary time, are there any organizations or social initiatives who work in generating the employment for tiger widows? As they are socially excluded, it is very natural that they might not be included in the workforce provided by the society or the state. Hi, Asma. Thank you for that question. Uh, to be very true, there are organizations. Uh, first is uh, there is a Tiger Widows Association where they bring together Tiger Widows and they have focus group discussions and they really do try to bring in NGOs so that uh, these Tiger Widows or other other animal attack widows or widows widows in general uh, they get uh, some sort of. Um, Uh, occupation uh, like stitching mostly stitching that i have heard of and and similar kind of activities is also done by the christian aid but uh, somehow this uh, trafficking nexus trafficking in human nexus in the area is uh, so uh, uh, so competent in in brainwashing women to you know Uh, uh, to, to 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 travel to the city by by uh, by the means of uh, believing in false promises of finding house housemates job in the city that is Kolkata. Not that everyone is given false promises. Uh, and what I believe where these organizations are failing uh, is uh, they are unable to create enough awareness about what is happening. Uh, somehow there is this understanding among these women that uh, if 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 they out of their will take up uh, a sex work in chonagachi or other brothels they will be allowed to send back home some money and this money would be a lump sum amount which is which is more than what they will earn by doing stitching work thank you thank you uh, we also have a question from emilia salazar uh, although she hasn't mentioned uh, Uh, question is for whom, but I believe it is for uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, are there roles that NGOs can play in providing better options for women in families facing dire financial situations? Dr. Chatterjee, would you like to answer that question? Uh, well, uh, well, definitely. I, when I was listening to Amrita, I was th I was thinking that yes, for example, Durbar Mohila Shamiti, which is a very active organization, I'm sure that must be providing very active support to the women. Uh, and what I'm also interested in, how much they, if if Amrita will also like to contribute in that, how much they are providing alternative options to these women uh, other than sex work. And yes, when it comes to kidney trade, well. um not so much not so much now the third sector is working to uh, on 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 this aspect for helping these women but definitely there are other ngos which are trying to promote organ donation especially in india which is 0.08 per million so that uh, the when when there is increased organ donation this black market trade uh, at least will be try, at least will be reduced if there is enough organs in the market if if, if there are enough organs are supplied definitely in juice working in increasing the organ uh, organ donation rate but because um 
these kidney donations, uh, kidney cell, uh, sellers are, they usually, it's a black market, if you remember. So when, unless these women will, will, will approach some organizations for help, they will be not able to help. And because it's a mar black market of kidney tray, which operates at a very clandestine level. So at the NGOs are not helping at, as far as I know, not helping at this level, but definitely in promoting in, in organ donation. And, uh, there, and definitely there are several uh, organizations in Calcutta, which must be, which are uh, working, uh, which are helping on traffic movement. For example, Shonglap, you may be aware, Amrita, Shonglap, uh, both working in India and Bangladesh and Durba Mahila Shamiti. Yes, and there are several programs like going out for alternative livelihood options. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions uh, for our uh, speakers? Uh, we still have a few more minutes. I believe someone had raised uh, their hand. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, would you like to uh, ask a question? Perhaps you can unmute yourself and ask a question, Ria. Okay, I think we may have uh, lost uh, Ria. Uh, so uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I will move towards uh, concluding our uh, session for today. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the South Asian Regional Committee of Tufts uh, and the Tufts Global Leadership uh, Institute for extending the help and support and making this happen. Uh, personally, I'd like to also extend uh, my gratitude to uh, Wyoma, uh, Mira, and of course, uh, Mahika, without uh, whom none of this would be possible. Uh, I would like to also thank uh, Dr. Shardamayin Chatterjee for uh, chairing this session, and uh, Urvi and Amrita for uh, being part of this panel today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and uh, we hope to see you for the uh, next uh, SARC program. Uh, Vayoma, would you like to formally conclude the session for us? Thank you so much for joining us today and um, taking your time out to do this panel. Um, I echo everything that Talakata said. And um, yes, thank you.